a Polígono Gallery y a la, a la inauguración de nuestra nueva exposición eh, Masters of Chinese Photography. Soy Maite Coloma, eh, codirectora de la galería junto a mi socia Sophie Gravier y vamos a tener durante la próxima hora una pequeña charla introductoria sobre el mercado del arte. Y para terminar, en nombre de Polígono Galería agradezco la confianza de Bulgari, nuestro patrocinador principal en esta exposición. Y también me gustaría disfrutar de la ocasión para agradecer a Maite Azcue de Eventus por su trabajo y su coordinación de este evento. And last, Maite Coloma wanted to uh, thank all of you for coming here on behalf of Poly Polygono Gallery. She also wanted to thank uh, Bulgari because they also have in a presentation here and also she wanted to thank um, Maite Azcue who helped with the organizing of this event. Ian Robertson, que es vicedirector y responsable del Master en Art Business en la Escuela de Socebis en Londres. También es corresponsal de Asia para la, la edición internacional de The Art Newspaper y consejero del Asia Art Archive en Hong Kong y director honorario de Educación en el MoMA de Pekín. También ha escrito varios libros sobre el mercado del arte, eh, los cuales son The Art Market, Understanding International Art Markets and Management, y su último libro, A New Art from Emerging Markets. Right, so um, might introduce Ian Robertson, who is the, the next speaker. Uh, he's a deputy, uh, the deputy, what's the name of the title, the deputy head? Deputy something. Um, uh, director of the Masters in Art Business. Yeah. In, uh, in Sotheby, in, in London. Uh, he's also the correspondent for the art newspaper for Asia. And uh, he's also an advisor for the Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong and the honorary director uh, for education of the MoMA in Beijing. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, he's written several books and his uh, newest book is A New Art from Emerging Markets, who he will be signing today. I think, I think the, um, no one can leave the room until they bought the book, isn't that the understanding? Uh, it's a bit um, disconcerting. I mean, I'm face, Elvis is looking at me, staring at me, from, if you look behind you, um, and he's, I mean, he's actually staring at me in a, in a very uncompromising way. That's, a, that's, that's actually an example of, um, is that a photograph or is that a brush painting? What do you think it is? So hands up, who thinks it's a photograph? ¿Quién piensa que es una fotografía que levante la mano? Okay, well, I mean, it makes sense. Photographic exhibition. That's actually a, a brush painting or a pen painting, isn't it? Pen, pen, pen painting. That's actually a pen, and that says a lot about Chinese patience. Um, and and, um, and you, often you find with a lot of Chinese artists that they spend an enormous amount of time in the creation of the works. And the message is quite clear, isn't it? There's Elvis, who, if Elvis was alive today, well, maybe he is actually. Is Elvis alive today? No, maybe he is alive today. I don't know. Anyway, but if he was alive today, Who would brand him? Who would brand Elvis? Can you imagine the companies swarming around for that brand? Probably the biggest brand of all time. And as you can see, the artist, um, it's uh, Ju Fudong. I don't know it worked very well. Ju Fudong um, has given him every single brand it's possible to give. So that, this, is an idea, this is a very good idea. Because you know, modern, the modern world meeting China. And on the right there, you actually have another, another work by a photographer, three panels. Again, old China, which is the, the factory meeting the new Chinese young girls um, almost uh, in, in, in color um, amongst the old China. So th this, this, this contrast between the old and the new is very strong in all emerging markets, obviously. Yeah. Bueno. Okay, now this, uh, the, most of this lecture is going to be slides, so you can relax. There'll be lots of pictures and things, not too many graphs. But a few, a few facts are important. And the most important one, I think, is this, um, in this report by Merrill Lynch, Cap Gemini. Yes, um, and, 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 and basically um, what it suggests is that the very, very ultra-rich today are now looking for what we call passion investments. I mean, they've tried everything else, basically, property, gold, um, precious metals, everything. But art is the last sort of frontier. And it's a very tricky market. I'll show you how tricky it is. But there's certainly a predilection among a lot of collectors now, HNWIs, high net worth individuals, um, who are becoming what we call investor collectors. There's no such thing as a collector who never sells, believe me. Even, um, well, the queen. The queen doesn't sell. So I think that's about it. Um, so other than the monarchy, there everyone and public museums, work will come back onto the market, believe me. Even Tyson Bonesia will sell at some point. 
So, yeah, and so it's no surprise that art, the value of art, is dependent on the amount of wealth which is pumped into the market. So when you see these enormous prices paid for Picassos, 30 million and above, or 100, 109 million for, uh, for Klimt, that's because there's so much liquidity in the market at the moment. People just have a lot of cash. And, and this is an example of how the world has changed because whereas most of the cash still resides in North America, increasingly the high net worth individuals are in Asia. And particularly in East Asia, there's a lot of liquidity now. And so that's driving up the prices, obviously, for Asian art. It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, and this is the key, I think. This is the key to the success of the continued success of the art market. And it's no surprise that the cities that have the most successful art markets, some of the advantages they have are the high capita, per capita incomes. Because there's a collecting base. There's a middle market um, to, 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 um, to keep the, the system going. Um, the other advantages that the, the, the top cities have, like Hong Kong, and to a lesser extent New York and London, are very, very good import duties, very low import duties, um, and extremely low, um, on the whole, sales taxes. Hong Kong is almost completely tax-free. Um, so that puts Hong Kong and now Singapore and Dubai, obviously, at a huge advantage. But basically, what you need in addition to that is an infrastructure, a cultural infrastructure. And all the cities on this grid, which are our major centers, have got infrastructures. Okay, so that's the, the background to the market in terms of how the wealth is generated. But how does, it, how does it go into the object? How does that value and that money translate into the value of the object at the end of the day? Well, basically, art is, is worthless when it's first made. I mean, your mother may like it, but nobody, if no one buys it, it's not worth anything. So all you art students who uh, leave college, you leave actually with, you know, with zero until you've made your first um, commercial transaction. And that would be in a, in a, in a what we call a beta or a delta, gamma, delta gallery, at the very lowest end, the primary market, the first market. Then you might go to what we call the primary alpha market. Now that is where you have the, like in this, I think this is a good example here, but gallery is a primary alpha market, dealing with very esta relatively established as well as emerging talents, sort of slightly higher price range, and you are looking, I suppose, towards investment in that, in that market. This market is huge risk, of course, because you don't know what's going to happen to the artist, exactly. They could, they could collapse, it could fall down. You're relatively safe here, although no, no guarantees. Once you get to the secondary market, that, that's where people make all their money. That's when you're buying and selling Picassos and um, people ask you for a Rodin and you try and find one and you take, you take 2%, basically, or whatever. Uh, and then the third market, which is the auction market, and that's a market where the only thing the auction market does is make prices transparent. Everybody knows what the price is. In the other four markets, or three markets, there isn't any transparency at all. You know, nobody knows. Very difficult to record. And this is a little bit how it works, because the Alpha Gallery is so successful, the really, really big dealers, because they have tremendously good contacts with senior collectors, all the, the top artists, they contract them, usually, under an obligation to just show with that dealer. Uh, so they get control over supply and, and demand, and they have, crucially, a very close relationship with museums. Now, the museum world will help to validate the, world, the work of the artist. So once an artist's work goes into a museum, it gets what we call reputation. And once it has reputation and historical significance, you can charge more money, basically. Um, so once you've got the museums, uh, the collectors, the artists, the top artists, and the auction houses to make your price transparent, you have everything, basically. But then you can practically print money, quite frankly, <laughs> and most of them do. Larry Gagosian, who's the biggest dealer in the world, um, has a really healthy turnover of about a billion a year, which translates as being a sixth of Sotheby's total worldwide global turnover, and that he's the largest dealer in the world. This gives you an idea about the sort of liquidity there is in this market, actually. It's huge. And again, just to give you an idea about what happens, because at the very bottom, you've got these uh, very low-down galleries, the ones I was telling you about, Alpha, Beta, uh, beta Gamma, Delta. Uh, and then at the very top, you've got the, the validation, which... Um, is a direct correlation with the price. Very occasionally, you will get artists who go straight into the alpha gallery sector, but that's very unusual. Usually, they go up through the ranks like that. And this is the last. I mean, I, I'm not very good at computer graphics, so this, I make the most of my skills, um, which are limited. 
Um, and anyway, it just shows you that although you're pretty safe with an alpha gallery, that the artist can still go away, even at the, at the alpha gallery stage. So you're paying 100,000 euros, you can still backfire. I mean, I'll show you some examples of art that's backfired at a million. So, you know, you, you know you're never 100% secure. It's not blue chip until he's dead. So we're all waiting. Well, not waiting for him to die, but I mean, we're waiting. No, we are waiting, actually. We're waiting for him to die. Because when they're dead, there's nothing better than a dead artist. I mean, <laughs> don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah. Okay, but I mean, uh, joking apart, I mean, once you've given your artist exposure in other markets through other dealers. So in other words, if you have a relationship with another dealer, a business relationship, then you can expose the work elsewhere in the world, obviously. And that does help create an international reputation for your artist, and that will probably lead to auction sales very quickly. Um, so that would help sustain the value for another five years. But even then, you know, you're not safe until the artist, as I said, is, um, I won't keep on repeating it, but that'll be on the front page of the paper, won't it? <laughs> okay, we'll skip this because there's too many charts, but it gives the same principle, so we'll go beyond that one. Yeah.